This is Dan Stilling, and you're listening to Cinepod, the cinematographer's podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben, guess what? What? You're about three feet away from me. Never happens. You know, I feel like we are going back in time right now to an era, you know, just a few years ago where every single one of these we were arm's reach. It was a simpler time. Yeah. It would always be like a Sunday night and I would like steal off into the night Mm. and come here to Hot Rod Cameras. And we also used to do 100% of the interviews here in person. And I will say that pandemics, uh, super bummer, not a fan of pandemics, Mm. but because of the pandemic, we started using Zoom and because we started using Zoom, we ended up doing a lot of remote interviews, and that was how you get people like Mandy Walker or Frederick Wiseman, some of the amazing people that we've had on. And also the person who is our guest this week, Daniel Stilling, DFF, which is the uh, Danish uh, Society of Cinematographers. Uh, mm-hmm. He was on the East Coast, I was on the West Coast, and we were not both in L.A. at the same time, so uh, we were able to do this interview. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that, that's great. So let's hop in and, and talk about Close Focus, focus. because... Uh, We kind of have a historical weekend that we just passed. We talk about theatrical and the theatrical experience and do people want to go to movie theaters? Mm. And I think the question has been answered, which is really interesting because if you had asked anyone last week, everyone was saying gloom and doom for the summer box office. But no, this weekend, it's an entirely different thing. Of all time, for all the box offices, this weekend was the third largest, which is huge. Yeah, yeah. So we had Barbie, which made, what, $165 million? Just in the U.S., yes, exactly. Just in the U.S.? Do we know how much it made worldwide? I'd have to check, but I heard it was significantly more, so... Pretty amazing. And Oppenheimer, which made like $80 million in one weekend. And, uh, you know, Christopher Nolan, sort of like James Cameron, just don't bet against him. Like, I I was looking at the stats and I want to say Tenet, which came out in the middle of the pandemic, still somehow made $300 million. Wow. Wow. I know. It's my least favorite Christopher Nolan movie. I, I agree. So did you see either Barbie or Oppenheimer? Did you participate in Barbenheimer? I, I could not participate in Barbenheimer. Everything was sold out. Like, I, I refused to sit. There was one ticket available for IMAX of Oppenheimer in the front row. I, I couldn't no, do it. No, no I wouldn't, so. wouldn't do that. Yeah. So I, I wanted to see it in IMAX, but I didn't want to make the perfect the enemy of the good. So I went and saw it in only 70 millimeter. <laughs> and um, and what did you think? It's pretty impressive, pretty awesome. Although, like, I will say this, and I would love to have Hoyta Van Hoytema on the show at some point, but a lot of that movie takes place in small boardrooms and stuff. And I was like, I wonder how, like, I wonder how IMAX would make this feel different. Hmm. But it is gorgeous. Hmm. The cinematography is amazing. The performances are incredible. And the attention to detail that they went to was just unbelievable. And I'm pretty sure we're looking at a lot of Oscar nominations. I would be shocked if Killian Murphy isn't nominated. I would not be surprised if Robert Downey Jr. was nominated. Hmm. I think Christopher Nolan definitely will be nominated. And I think it will definitely be nominated for Best Picture. Yeah, I have not seen anything about it. I haven't seen a trailer. I've been keeping myself. Okay, well, spoiler alert: there's a big bomb. (laughs) It's like it's. I was hoping that you can't really spoil a movie, a biopic of Robert Oppenheimer. Oh, I thought for sure like it was going to fade to black as you hear the sound of the, (whistles) like yeah, Yeah. like it's it's going down and at the first (laughs) test of Trinity. uh, I I have like a a personal sort of connection to the whole uh, you know Uh Oppenheimer thing, like my. Both of my grandfathers worked on that project, and Whoa. I have like a letter at home from Oppenheimer saying, you know, thanking one of my grandfathers Whoa. for like how incredible his contribution was to the That's project. Cool. But I got to say, I feel very conflicted about the, the whole thing, as I think a lot of people do. And I'm imagining this as movie, Robert Oppenheimer did. Clearly. I'm sure. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's a uh, I will go see it. But I have a f- I feel like I should wait a little bit and go when like the theater might be half full or something mm. or I, I don't know. And then I can really get the the, the, but, the proper seating. I, I mean, but I definitely thought it looked great in 70 millimeter the projection was awesome and uh yeah i mean it's totally worth seeing on the big screen i have every intention to see barbie i have not seen it yet Mm. uh i'm really excited like 
I don't I don't know if it's misogyny or what. It's misogyny. Spoiler mm. alert, it's misogyny. But like I'm seeing like there was a, a think piece from The Guardian talking about how like Greta Gerwig is killing independent filmmaking by making a big studio film. And I'm like, what? What? Indie filmmaker hasn't done what? this before, and it's it. Like I feel like I, did they I, say that about Ryan Johnson? Did they I say mean, did, like, like, did they, did say, they say that about Christopher Nolan? Did they say that about John Favreau? Steven I mean, Soderbergh. It's like yeah, yeah. yeah. You, no, you, you can go down the down the the list. I mean, it's like so many noteworthy studio filmmakers came out of out of the indies, and Greta Gerwig was a huge actor before starting to direct and she's been directing for like 10 years now yeah and uh i actually like i feel good for everyone involved because i feel like margot robbie is such an amazing talent as an actor and she does stuff like i Tonya, which should have been a bigger hit than it was and i really loved it what a fantastic movie but it didn't it just didn't get traction and i feel like if ever there was someone you look at and go that's what a fucking movie star looks like it's margot robbie and again like on the subject of misogyny last oscar season when both both Babylon and Amsterdam underperformed seeing pieces that were blaming her. And I'm like, what? How is that even <laughs> fucking possible? Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm dropping a lot of F bombs in this house wrap. All right. All right. Well, why don't we get to the interview with Daniel Stilling? Let's do it. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. My next guest, I have wanted to have on the show. For so long, he is one of the most talented and hardest working cinematographers in the world. He's a member of the Dansk Film Photograph Forbund. I tried my best to say it. I don't know if I got it right. But that is the Danish Society of Cinematographers, as equivalent to like the ASC. And a hell of a nice guy. Please welcome to the show, Dan Stilling. Hey, Leah. How's it going, man? Long time uh, listener, first time caller. I am so happy that we are getting to do this. We're finally able to make this happen. Man, this has been a long time coming, and I'm uh, excited as ever to be part of this. Uh, I mean, you get the biggest, the most talented people here, and uh, just little me being here, I'm, I'm super flattered. Thank you for, mm. for having me, for sure. You are way too humble. <laughs> you are way too humble. Dan, Dan, you are such a huge talent, and I'm going to direct people to go to your uh, website, which it's dandop.com, isn't it? That's correct. You're always putting up great mini reels of stuff that you do, and your reel is like, I direct people to take a look at your... When people ask me like what a reel should look like, I actually tell them to go look at your reel. And, oh, uh, man, thank you. Uh, no, I, I, I think, it, I think you've, you've been doing it great for years, and man... I'm just uh, Forrest Gumping my way through it, trying <laughs> yeah. to, to get the better looking stuff in there, but uh, thank oh, you, man. man. That That's nice. I do make a, a point in uh, trying to always keep it updated so, so people can have a better feel of my work, even when I'm working constantly. Yeah. And you are grinding it. You do so much. You are busy. I know that you work a lot and you elevate every project that you're associated with. The look of every project I feel is I know it's going to be of this like top tier quality because you're involved, but not all the stuff that you work on is high budget stuff. So you're bringing out really, really good look. I know sometimes with modest means, maybe that's a good place for us to start in your work. How important is the budget in order for you to do what you do? Or do you think in general it is for cinematographers to do their job? Well, uh, when you start in this career, sometimes you don't have a choice and uh, you take the jobs that go come your way and you try to do the best out of it. When I started getting DP jobs, they weren't glamorous or big budget, anything like that. So you learn real quick how to get the best out of very little. Uh, mm. There is a minimum amount that you need to have in order to, to not only have the gear that you need to accomplish it, but also everybody around you if, if you ha don't have a production designer with some means of creating a nice set, it doesn't matter how well you photograph it if it looks like junk. So there is a, a minimum necessary, but after that, it's up to your ideas and whatever you can come up with to get the best result out of it. It's funny, uh, one producer that I worked with recently on a bigger budget movie, he was also a producer on a, a small budget movie uh, that was called Priceless. 
And uh, there was this one shot with this person is sitting on the ground crying, and it wasn't it wasn't shot listed. Uh, the person was sitting there, and the director was like, "This is great. Let's let's shoot this." I turned one light to her, and I wanted to dolly out, but we didn't have the time to to set up dollies, and uh, there were no gimbals and that kind of stuff. I asked them to bring me a towel and an apple box. I put the camera on top of the apple box and uh, on top of a towel, and I just pulled the towel back on uh, the wooden floor and got this nice dolly back. And uh, the producer remembered that, that, the ingenuity of that shot, and uh, hired me for this bigger budget shoot that I actually just did last year in Canada. So those things happen even in the high budget. Well, I was going to say, I'm sure that it wasn't only because of the Apple box sh- dolly shot that you got that job. I'm sure that, that, that you know, that, that is that is very memorable. Uh, but, I would but, hope uh, not. <laughs> I would hope that's a little more behind it than that. Well, yeah. OK, so you need a minimum budget for the production designer to do their job. You need a minimum budget to bring on the appropriate crew and the technology. But how do you feel about all the rest of it? Because the, the range of budgets changes so dramatically between one type of story and another. I certainly know from back from my days of of working on set and working in the camera department that sometimes the truck was huge and you had every toy at your disposal. Other times there's very little there. How do you go about making sure that you have what you need and also can be friendly to whatever that production is uh, is forced to deal with? No, that's true. And uh, actually, one of the, the projects that I've done that I'm most proud of, it's called Chasing Bullet. It's a Steve McQueen biopic, and it was if think of a low budget, it was lower than that. And it does not look low budget at all. It, it really doesn't. It looks phenomenal. It looks like you had every uh, you know dollar in the world for that. And uh, we did not. We had a very small crew. Uh, it was ten days. Oh my uh, goodness. Shooting days. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it was one location per day. It was very well written in a way that you could shoot it in that way. The producer and the director they were really well versed in writing it in a in a way that it works for the budget they had. And uh, I light very simply. I, I use a big light usually outside, and it can be, and, and big can also be an M18. It's not sure. that big. Relative, yes, uh, yes, relatively yeah. big, yeah. yeah. And then a, a, a small soft light inside. If I have those two, everything else is bonus. And that was basically what we had in, in uh, Chasing Bullet. Maybe oh, wow. a couple other uh, instruments, but that was it. You know, cameras cameras and lenses have gotten so good in, in, a, in a low cost that that's not super critical anymore but you know you you check that and then i shot the second unit uh, dp on the martian and i didn't have that many uh, tools there either i shot all the launches at cape canaveral for for the rockets and i i had a a very good camera lenses but it was also a small crew so you can do a lot with little Uh, i remember my my uh first bigger commercial that i got right in the beginning uh, it was still film I had a huge grip truck. I had a huge electric truck. Uh, we didn't use hardly <laughs> half of uh, the contents of the truck. So I think the important thing is uh, during pre-production, even if you don't have that much time for pre-production, you have to uh, really assert what you're going to need and figure out the equipment that you can use that can be used for several different things. And uh, so minimize your footprint that you're going to need for the shoot. And uh, you can do a lot with a little. That's uh, very true. You mentioned the Martian. We'll we'll get to the Martian, but I, I feel mm-hmm. like there's a lot more of the Dan Stilling story to talk about before we get to working with you know Ridley Scott and all that yeah. stuff. So, Dan, tell me about you know the beginnings. Uh, when did you get into this business? How long ago was that? And uh, what made you decide that this is going to be the career that you could follow? Well, I actually uh, started to the horror of my uh, fellow camera crew people. I started in sound. Oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, not in motion. Think, I don't think a lot but, of people listening to this show who are, don't work in production know that there is the, a very sort of friendly, I'm going to say friendly rivalry between the camera yeah. and sound department. Certainly in, in, in narrative production, there is a, a love-hate. So the fact that you started in sound, your fellow sound people probably look at you as a traitor so. <laughs> <laughs> we're frenemies we're all frenemies no and and you know what sound uh, you didn't hear me say this but sound is one of the most important things in a movie but uh, i didn't say that it, it, it's very <laughs> true yeah. but so, so. Uh, i started in in music actually uh, mm. i was uh, 14 years old and i started playing guitar and I got in a band and I was always the one setting up the, the little gear we had for the, the little concerts in bars and stuff. 
I was always the one setting it up. So I got very interested in technical stuff. And then we got to record our first album, it was amazing. And I watched with eagle eyes, the sound technician, uh, the sound engineer, how he, he did his thing. And I was like, yeah, that I, I see that, I see that. And when I was 17 or 18, I got my first job at a, a music studio. That was when I lived, uh, I'm from Denmark, but I lived uh, part of the time in Brazil and part of the time in Denmark. My dad was an engineer, he traveled all over the world. And uh, then when I moved back to Denmark, there were just very few and far in between sound technician jobs. So I ended up in a small TV station, a local TV station as a sound guy. And uh, eventually I stumbled over Steadicam. I saw a show that was this guy walking in, in this beautiful garden and the camera was just perfectly floating in the air, capturing what he was saying. And I was just mesmerized with that. And I was like, what is that? And then I found out it was a Steadicam and I fell in love with it. Eventually uh, got to a workshop in Italy uh, where Gary Brown, he taught it. He invented the Steadicam and it was just revelation for me. It was amazing. I loved every moment of it. And I said, this is what I need to do. I went to LA and bought my first rig used and uh, started working there. And, and uh, I got great friends. We became great friends in the Steadicam community. So uh, eventually somebody got called up and they couldn't do a job. They would send it over to me and I got great opportunities. My first big break was a uh, Steadicam and B camera operator on Scrubs. Mm. And uh, that was uh, Rich Davis, great operator that got me that job. Fantastic. And yeah, and, uh, uh, yeah, so was Charles Pappert after you or before you then? No, too, he was I mean... before uh, mm -hmm. Rich Davis. It was mm -hmm. Charles and then Rich. And then uh, I was working alongside him on the second unit or B camera on first unit. And I was also A camera when he was DPing uh, episodes and that kind I of stuff. I was going to say, uh, Ch Charles is a good friend of the show. He's a good friend of mine. I, I, yeah, I'm sure a good friend of yours. And uh, yeah. Scrubs was really, really known for the Steadicam in particular because in some ways, it's sort of an ER parody and ER, of course, very known for, for steady <laughs> yeah. cam. So uh, I got to say Scrubs looked like a hell of a lot. Uh, it looked like fun. It looked like it'd be a, a really fun show to be on. It was every day just sort of like a laugh or I mean, I'm sure it's hard work, too. But, you know, to this day, it was the most fun I've ever had in the business. And wow. it was a great introduction to bigger budget stuff that I got. And we just got really good at not shaking the camera and not laughing out loud when they would say stuff. <laughs> at the end, always at the end, when the scene was kind of done, they would ad lib. Mm. And they would ad lib sometimes the most absurd things that would never, ever make it to <laughs> to broadcast. And we were just try dying behind the camera. It, it was great. Every day was great. Some days were really long and that kind of stuff. But we had a great time doing it. The cast crew, everybody was just amazing. All right. So you're steady cam hopping in Hollywood. You've, you've worked your way up to this point. When did you decide that hey, it's time for you to spread your wings and that you're not going to do steady cam anymore? Or I, I could be wrong. Do you still ever suit up or is it that is that now a portion of your life you, you've put to bed? No, I have uh, since hung the, the vest, but that was a long uh, transition where I was still operating and operating Steadicam. And sometimes I would get jobs where I was DPing and operating the Steadicam as well. That, that was for quite a while, especially commercials. I started getting a lot of commercials out of town. Uh, I started traveling a lot for that. So there was a, a long transition with that. But then it started becoming more DPing, less operating or steady cam operating. And eventually I said, I, I don't do it enough to keep sharp on it. I'd rather have the people that, that are doing it day in, day out, do a better job than I can. Uh, so then I, I hung the vest. I still have my rig for emotional reasons, but I, I haven't used it in years and years. So, like you, t you talk about this long transition. It is really difficult for a lot of people to switch their specialty from one thing to another when that's what you're known for. Do you remember the first time you got a call for Steadicam work that you then had to say, hey, I'm sorry, I, I don't do that anymore. I could DP it for you. But if you need me to Steadicam, I'm sorry, I, I just that's not my job anymore. It happens to this day. It's oh, still wow. happening. Oh, yeah, wow. okay. I, I still get calls every once in a while and then I refer other operators. But uh, it does happen and it does Sometimes it does hurt a little bit saying no to to that, but 
I have moved on, and, and yeah, you, you, I, I don't want to embarrass myself either. Getting a, going on set and and of making a fool of myself. <laughs> I I don't think many people realize how you really do have to practice your craft, and you know it's not necessarily like riding a bike that just because you did something for a while you can immediately go back to it. That that requires so much strength and stamina and finesse to be a good steady cam operator. There, let me tell you. Anybody can be a steady cam operator. Not anybody can be a good steady cam operator. There is so much human element that goes into that. What do you think about people who just assume that when you put that on your body, that it that's really what's doing the work and that the human is almost secondary to, to that? Is I mean, I, I think that is a misconception of producers out there in particular. But what's your feeling about the steady cam world and moving on and moving into something else? Yeah. Well, if they think that they're in for a rude awakening, because uh, that's obviously not how it goes. It took me two years of practicing by myself before I felt confident enough to take somebody's money, uh, calling myself a Steadicam operator. So it, it takes a lot of practice. Like Garrett said, it's like having to move a piano and play it at the same time. Do you think it really helped inform or helped teach you uh, composition for your work as a DP? Oh, no doubt about it. As an operator, you're all constantly fighting that dance, and at the same time, you're also fighting everything that's not supposed to be in the shot, mm. uh, which is the, the hardest part of a shot, is uh, omitting the stuff you're not supposed to see, because we tend to, to infringe and put a light here, put a light there, and, and it becomes harder that way. So it definitely has informed my style of creating pictures as a DP. Yeah, you, not only have you shot all these different genres in narrative, but you've shot all these different genres of stuff. You've done promos, you've done television. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are wildly different styles, wildly different looks. And I'm actually, I guess I'm rather pleased to say that I think I saw one of your earliest projects, at least according to IMDb. I saw Cats 101 on Animal Planet. So, oh <laughs> so we want to go really far back here. This oh, is, no, no, you know, that's this, not. It's this, like 20 something years ago now. So, uh, oh. but, uh, but so you've done documentary work. You've done documentary mm -hmm. for, for television uh, and series. I watched Trading Spaces at 1.2. I don't know if I saw any episodes that you worked on, but you've done this huge variety of stuff. And of course, the, the best way to get invited back to do more of that is to get give the look and style of, of what that is supposed to be. Can you talk about how doing some of this work that doesn't necessarily feel maybe like the traditional narrative, you know, cinema sort of look informs your work? I mean, because having that experience, I got to imagine, is way better than not having it. And it gives you probably a sense of urgency and an idea of, of how to work. But you tell me, do you feel like having a diverse background helps you with the stuff you do today? I like to think so, and not only in the style that you shoot, uh, and you have to be adaptive to whatever the styles are that you're in. But besides that, what has helped me a lot was I also edited back in the beginning of my career. So I learned a lot about editing. And uh, nowadays I can go and, and see, uh, say to the director, if you want to cut from this to this, that's not going to work that, that well. If we do this other shot, you have a better cut there. I'm not a, by any means an expert editor, but I know the basics so I can guide through that. And even sometimes uh, thinking about the score that's going to come below this. And I can say, the score you talked to me about for this scene, if we do that shot that moves fast this way, it won't match with it. So it won't, it won't cut as well. All these different styles that you do in your past, that all helps you inform an overall picture. So you have a better grasp of what are you doing and what you can do better to make the story better. You know, I think you really hit on something important here. Um, I meet and have worked with and uh, have customers of a lot of young DPs, people who are just sort of like starting out in this world. And I, I will tell you that not having the concept of how things cut together or not having a background in editing, I think is probably one of the most difficult things for new DPs to be able to overcome because there are sometimes that shot A and shot B, no matter what you do, they are not 
not going to fit together. And if you don't have an opinion on set on the day when it comes time to do that and someone's telling you, we got to go over here and do this and you can't push back or figure out like just because you say it's this is going to cut. And I've seen these battles take place and I've seen people get steamrolled. I I worked as an AC for a very long time and I'm like, you know, I'm not in a position to say anything right now, but I'm really sure that these two shots are not going to work. Can you talk about how important is that skill set in trying to make anything feel coherent and feel like it's, it's all part of, you know, the same project? Yeah, uh, one of the most important things that that happened to you as a DP is that you'll be asked for your opinion a thousand times a day. And you have to have an opinion on everything that you're putting your hand on. And you have to have a a reasoning behind that opinion. It can't just be, yeah, I like that because it's cuter. Mm. <laughs> that the, you, you won't go very far and you be, you won't be respected very long if, if you don't have a sound reasoning behind this. And the reasoning only comes out of experience or education or that kind of stuff. So it's incredibly important to have a varied background that will inform all these decisions, all these uh, opinions that you have. So you can actually uh, go to the director in a respectful way and say, hey, hey, I, I think you want the shot. What if we do this other shot? It will work better because of this, 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 and that. And uh, 9.9 times out of 10, they'll listen to you if you have a, a good reasoning behind it. And uh, that's important. One thing is is to make uh, pretty pictures. A lot of people can do that. That's not what what's going to differentiate you on set. It's how you deal with the mechanics of getting those pretty pictures, with the mechanics of how they fit together afterwards, and how they work to the overall vision of the the director and producers. That's how you get more uh, more jobs out of it. Okay, so the, the editor is typically not on set in mm-hmm. most productions, and the script supervisor sort of serves as their advocate. Do you feel that maintaining a really good relationship with the script supervisor is like your strongest ally or script supervisor in First AD? Who is your team that helps you make sure that everything is uh, going to be composed and is going to cut together the way that, that you, you want it to be? It, oh, I man, mean, it's, the script supervisor is so important. You can get in so much trouble. You just start shooting a dinner scene with uh, eight people in a round tra- table. And then all of a sudden, oh, man, what side were, was I here? And you start painting yourself in a corner really quick. So you better be in good terms with the, with the script supervisor. They will help you out of big problems. If uh, I steamroll the script supervisor and say, yeah, no, I, I got this. Oh, you're going to be in so much trouble so quick. You, you're one of the most international cinematographers I know. You're always traveling. You're working in a lot of different ways. I mean, we've had many people on the show who are similar, who have this sort of nomadic lifestyle. But do I recall correctly that you also are a pilot and that you fly sometimes to different places and uh, to work? Is that part of your identity? Do I recall this correctly? That's correct. Uh, I do travel a lot and now more international than ever. I go a lot between Europe and the US. I do a lot of commercials in Florida. I do a lot of my narrative stuff in California or in other places where uh, the California production companies go to. I I was just, I lived six months in Canada last year. So yeah, I'm all over the place and it has its good and bad sides. It's hard to leave the family for so long. I have a 14 year old daughter and my wife. So they are very patient with me. But, and and also, yes, I am a private pilot, instrument rated, and I do uh, uh, on occasion uh, fly to to jobs depending where I'm in in the world doing it. It is a lot of fun and it's It's a lot of fun to have a a real mission to do when you have to fly somewhere for actual work, not not just for a very expensive meal (laughs) by the time you pay for the gas. (laughs) Hey, well, let's talk about The Martian. I mean, The Martian was a big cultural phenomenon starting online in the in the script and the book and the sort of like the formation of the whole thing. And then becoming this this major movie, you know, with Ridley Scott and Matt Damon and all the stuff. You got a call to go shoot a portion of the movie. What what was that like? And uh, I mean, it's a huge, you know, probably $100 million movie. And you're shooting like the intro, the beginning of this whole thing. Tell us about that. Oh, The Martian. What was that again? I mean, <laughs> I can't remember. It. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> Some people will accuse me of, of uh, keep using The Martian to promote myself. But uh, it, it's I mean, uh, I read The Martian when he had just started very beginning of the zeitgeist and, mm-hmm. and uh, had just been published for the first time in, in one book. 
because the original Andy Weir had done it on, on uh, Amazon by chapter, the kind of stuff, and then he put it all together. I, I got very early in, and I loved the book, and I, and I thought to myself, one day this will be an amazing movie. And then a couple of years later, I read on the, uh, I think it was Deadline, oh, Ridley Scott is, is doing The Martian. Oh, this is amazing. I was super excited to watch the movie, and uh, the producer called me and and he was very you know nonchalant about it i have this project i need a few days of of shooting in cape canaveral are you available uh, what's the project oh it's uh, called the martian i said oh is that the the ridley one he said yes and i was like yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I was quietly uh, uh couldn't believe that 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 had that had just happened and uh then he asked if i was available and i said well let me check my calendar <laughs> and of course, it was available. <laughs> it looks like I could squeeze you in. <laughs> I can squeeze you in. I have to move some things around, but I'll, 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 I'll make it happen. So then I went back down to uh, Cape Canaveral, and it was a few amazing days. Uh, we shot a launch of the Orion capsule, which is in the middle of the movie, it's in the end of the movie, and also a million background plates. It was right at the beginning of the process uh, of them shooting the movie, so they didn't know exactly what kind of plates they needed. So we had the run of the uh, of Kennedy Space Center. I went all in and out the the VAP that huge building. I was on top of it, uh, inside, uh, under the the roof, and in all places humans usually don't get to go. I got to go. It was it was really great and shot so many different plates. Shot some stuff in the rocket garden and and uh, so anytime you see rockets in the background it's, it's stuff I shot plus the, the middle and the end and one of the cool things was I went then to to the set in Budapest and I met uh, Ridley and uh, during the process of shooting it uh, the, the launch was gonna be right at sunrise and uh, it was fairly cloudy so much so that the rocket didn't go first day we had to go back next day and do it but that first day I, I realized it was gonna be a beautiful sunrise with all the clouds and I decided to shoot a, a time-lapse Mm. that they hadn't asked me uh, to do, but I, I did it. And, and when I got to meet Ridley, he was like, are you the bloke that uh, shot that sunrise? Great job. So that, that was nice <laughs> to hear. Well, you know, I talk about you being very hardworking and always have stuff going on. I, I l went to your IMDb and you've got five upcoming things, which I think is really fun because usually when I look <laughs> at people, maybe they have one. If they're really busy, they've got two. You've got five in various states between like pre-production, post-production, in production. I mean, when do you take a moment? I feel like sometimes your, your family may not see you very much. Do you ever bring them along with you or do you try to integrate the family into work at all or do you really try to keep things separate? How, how does it work? being, you know, a husband and a father and a, and a busy DP? Oh, no, always. I always try to, to bring the family with me when I can. Uh, my wife, she's an ex-medic, so she she has been in the business. <laughs> she knows, she she knows long hours, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she knows the hours and she understands how, how it goes with traveling and all that stuff. And uh, my daughter is 14. She's getting uh, uh, curious about it. So, uh, for example, last year, this movie Valiant One that I shot in Vancouver, uh, they came for a few weeks and, and uh, stayed there and went with me on set. And my daughter looked all over and, and found it very interesting. So I always try to, to bring them along when I can. And uh, when I can't, I try to get a break and uh, be able to go back, see my family and go back to work. Sometimes I might be gone a couple months at a time. It's not easy, I have to be honest, uh, but it's the, the life we chose. So <laughs> I, I could go out and, and learn how to make bread and become a, a Danish pastry chef, but I'd rather do what I do. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Uh, so if your daughter decided she wanted to get into the industry and do this sort of thing too, would you be supportive and encouraged or would you try to talk her out of it? What do you, what do you think? Is you think, uh, you know, you, you'd like a, another generation to do what you're doing or maybe not so much? Do you, have you thought about this at all? I, I love what I do so much that uh, if, if she can find the same enjoyment and the same love that I do, I would absolutely encourage her and anybody else that can find fulfillment, uh, sustainability, which is the big uh, problem we are encountering right now, and uh, pleasure out of it. Absolutely. So, Daniel, when you see the final result, when you see these uh, projects in a theater or on a streaming service or wherever it might be, does that trigger something in your mind, too, about like, ah, you know what? I like how this turned out. 
but maybe I would have done it this way. Or like, well, what kind of goes through your, your mind? Do you feel like you're, you're learning when you see the final result? Is it usually what you envisioned? How is that sort of aspect of, you know, you've, you've gone through all of this work to get there. You did all, you built it in pre-production and production, and then it went through post. How is that self-reflexive for you? How do you feel, you know, going forward? Well, overall, it better be a version of what you thought about, otherwise <laughs> you're not doing it right. But at the same time, if you're not unhappy with something, uh, you're, you're not being critical of your work and you're not evolving and getting better. So yeah, I, I constantly see things, yeah, overall I like the movie, but I can't believe I did this. Why didn't I do it the, uh, the other way? And uh, I, I'm my worst critic and it's good and bad because it, it helps you uh, move forward and, and getting better. But it also takes away a little bit of the, the enjoyment. I mean, seeing stuff I shot on the big screen, it's one of the most rewarding things. Uh, and people won't know the, the little nuances that you are being picky about. But it's important to be picky. It's important to, to learn, okay, I did it this way and this is the result. If I had done it another way, I think it might have been better and just keep those mental notes inside and, and apply it next time. And uh, the moment you stop being critical and say, yeah, that, that's all good. You, you're overstay, you're welcome. You're, you're bound to do something else at that point. Uh, I think that's a really great place for us to leave it. Uh, Daniel, where can people find you if they want to track you down? I know I've already mentioned your website, but you do any social media things. Where can people find you if they, they want to have you shoot something for them or they want to reach out? Well, you can find me on benrock.com. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, you've heard, I, you've heard our show once or twice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't I didn't have uh, problems getting my domain from a boat uh, manufacturer. But <laughs> uh, no, I, I think uh, my, the, the best spot is on, on uh, my website. Uh, you can see uh, my reels, dendop.com. But I'm also on Instagram at Daniel Stilling DFF and, and Facebook as well. And now on threads uh, as, in, as the new thing. But but yeah, I'm, I'm all in these places, uh, but the best uh, spot to, to find my stuff is on the website. Daniel, this is so much fun. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hey man, this was a, a blast for me. Thank you so much. All right. So that was Daniel Stilling. Hey, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm so glad we got to make that happen. That awesome. was really great. Let's come back when you got some more stuff. And that won't be long. He's got so much stuff going on right now. Sweet. And now, short ends. So, Ben, it is short end time of the show. It's the time when we talk about our obsession. What, hey, what, let, let's shake it up. Why don't you start? Ooh, okay, I'll start. Um, well, quick recap from last week. I had mentioned that my short end was Command Z, the mm -hmm. new uh, Steven Soderbergh direct-to-consumer series that you can buy for seven ninety nine. dollars You could watch all eight episodes. I did buy it. I did watch it. Command Z is really good. I enjoyed it. It did take me a couple times to get through it just because uh, I'm interrupted here at work sometimes, and it was mostly after hours that I, that I watched it, but I have to say that it doesn't feel exactly like something you've seen before, but it does feel familiar enough. And it is in a very sort of Steven Soderbergh, slightly experimental sort of way. And I enjoyed it. And there is there is a little bit of a message to it. It is definitely a, a message that maybe billionaires won't understand, but it's a kind of a concept piece about, you know, the destruction of the planet. And also there is a lot of exposition to kind of, uh, you know, set up the whole system that, mm -hmm. that they're going through. But beyond that, something I looked forward to at the end of every episode you get some recommendations for further reading, oh, further cool. research, or just movies, recommended movies. So it's like, oh, hey, if you wanted to see something more about this, watch movie X, Y, and Z, which I got to say, which which was great. It was really fun to have this little sort of like thing that was put in there of like, hey, if this really speaks to you, here's extra actions and steps you can take that I don't see other people in more traditional forms of entertainment doing. It's like, it's very blatant. Here it is. Here's yeah. a way for you to take action. Here's a way for you to inform yourself, or here's just some other great movies to watch. So oh, I, thought cool. th I thought that was great. So my, my, my actual short end is something called Case Cart. And Case Cart, we have the only one in the country right now here at Hot Rod Cameras. It is a giant HPRC case. It's quite hefty. But what's cool about the Case Cart is that it has 
everything that you would need to turn this into like a production cart by way of a top shelf built into the cart. And literally all you do is grab hold of it and lift it straight up. And it's on these telescoping steel poles that completely make just this case into a cart and there's wheels that fit underneath the whole thing so that you can roll around big pneumatic ones with Hmm. fancy innovative like you know brakes on them it is very very clever and i think that it would do really really well except for one fatal flaw for Uh most people oh no and that is the price it's two thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Like sprays Cyclone B as you as you walk down the that hallway would, with it. That would be a really terrible, That's a literally look. fatal flaw. That, that you, would be you, a fatal you, flaw. The, the fatal flaw of this one is is that it'll be fatal to some people's wallets. But mm. that that being said, they've explained to me why it is this expensive, and I get it. It could totally be a data handling cart, or a drone cart, or a power cart, camera cart. It could be all these different things. But really. I think who it's for is going to be corporate producers who have budgets, uh, high-end commercials, or possibly studios. If you are an independent, if you are a uh, camera assistant, I really don't think this is the cart for you just because of the price. But there's nothing else out there like it. And the fact that the wheels come off, go inside, and you can fit like you could fit like a you know a, a Mac Studio and a RAID inside of the whole thing, and you literally slap a label on it and it goes on an airplane, it goes on FedEx. It is super handy, and for the person out there who's been going like, where has this been all my life? I need a cart that all fits inside of just a big Pelican case that also is on wheels. The whole damn thing rolls. You don't have to, to carry it ever. It's brilliant. You just have to have deep pockets or uh, have someone else who's going to pay for it. And if that's you, you should reach out to Hot Rod Cameras. Nobody else in this country has it. The only people who have it is Hot Rod. And if you're in the Burbank area and you want to come play with it, it's really cool. I've actually been I'm, uh, I'm talking right now and I want to go play with it. All right, well, I'm going to talk to some people here about making a little video for it, too, because right. if you know what it is and you understand what it is, it's a bargain. If you are just trying to compare it to all the other cases out there, you're going to get or all the other carts out there. You are going to say, wow, this thing is pricey. And uh, I, they don't deny it. It's it's. It's really well built, but it's also uh, it's not for everybody. And uh, if it's for you, come on down and, and take it off our hands. You might enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Ben, what is your short end this week? Well, it's a podcast. It's a single episode of a podcast that anyone listening to this might like anyway called The Business. It's about show business hosted by Kim Masters. It's on uh, it's from KCRW. Are you being serious right now? I'm being very serious. Okay, because you, you know this is. Uh, I, have you just discovered this? You've never like no, listened no, no, to this no. before. It's, no, I've listened to the business on and off. It's a specific episode of the oh, business. Oh, okay, gotcha. Because this is like a very popular, very no, popular. I've been listening to the business since Claude Brodesser Ackner was hosting it. Like I've I've listened to this podcast forever. But Kim Masters this past week had uh, Mike Seymour from FX PhD slash FX Guide, and he was there kind of to counterweight all the paranoia about AI. Oh, interesting. And it was very interesting to hear him talk about, like, his whole point, I think I could summarize it as, the AI isn't the problem. The problem is how people are using it, who's using it, and what guardrails are or aren't around it. You know, Boy, that almost sounds like the NRA argument, though. It's not the guns, it's the people. No, but he's saying that the AMPTP's uh, shitty proposal yes. about scanning actors and using them as extras and not paying them, he's like, well, that's not the AI's fault <laughs> that people want to use it badly, but like, you could use that well. And he, he said a version of what I've been saying. What I've been saying is like, if you said to an actor, we're going to scan you, we're going to pay you like three days worth of work for the scanning, and then every time we use your likeness, you have to sign off on us using it, and also we're going to pay you for one-tenth or one-fourth of a day for you not even having to show up. We're going to use your likeness, you're going to be paid every single time we use it, you're going to get all the same residuals you would get in any other world for it, and you get to approve where it shows up. Because, you know, like, who knows why you might not want your likeness as an extra on any given thing, but you should have the right. You should. You You, should. You would have the right as an actor to say, I don't feel like working on that show. You should have the same right to say, I don't want my likeness in that show. Yeah, and I think that it's uh, very true for commercials, too. Some people don't want to endorse a product and may not want to have their, their likeness endorsing something. But anyway, I feel like people should check it out because Mike Seymour is sort of advocating for ethical use of AI and also saying the obvious, which is it's here. We're going to be using it. People are going to writers are going to be using AI. Writers are going to choose to use AI. I know someone who just had to fire someone because their employee was using some sort of AI 
program and doing a terrible, terrible job in submitting work that they clearly well, didn't that's, even read. That's, <laughs> so. But that, that's the problem. Well, I mean, there was a, a famous story a couple of weeks ago about a lawyer who tried to use chat GPT mm-hmm. in, in a For legal, legal document, in a, in a legal case in a court of law. Yeah. And the thing is, chat GPT just made up a bunch of legal precedents that didn't exist. That didn't exist. And yeah, because I mean, it'll do that. So it's like, could he have used chat GPT to help him put together his argument? Sure. Should he have double che- and triple checked every single thing? Should he have substantially revised it? Yes. So, you know, Mike Seymour is kind of saying, like, writers are going are gonna to use it. There have to be, again, guardrails around, like, when it goes through and scrapes the whole internet and uses all that data, because it's just turning the entire internet into ones and zeros that it can then sample and reuse. Uh, you know, also kind of famously, Sarah Silverman is, is suing a couple of companies because she realized that her book, I think it's called The Bedwetter, ended up in that data set. And, you know, it's like, if you can go to ChatGPT and say, write jokes like Sarah Silverman, it's not going to put her stand-up comedy out of business, because the reason that that works is you go see her do it. But if somebody, if she was going to try and sell a TV show, and you can just bottle the essence of Sarah Silverman and have it spit it out, I'm still highly skeptical that that would really work anyway. But I do think that everyone who is contributing to the data set that becomes ChatGPT or becomes MidJourney, becomes any of these things, it should be set up so that there's no way it can use someone who doesn't opt in, that if it's using your stuff to a certain degree, you should be compensated. And that's sort of what Mike Seymour was saying was, we just need to set up ethics, ethical laws and ethical business practices about how to use AI that nobody would dispute. Well, I'm pretty sure that that's never going to happen because it seems like you know whatever <laughs> ethics you try to impose on someone else, someone else is going to claim that that violates their their morality or mm-hmm. violates what what it is that they believe. So uh, we can't. Well, decide he's just a- saying like poured over the same exact laws you would have about using your likeness in advertisement. Like I can't use your likeness in advertisement if I don't have your approval. So. Why could I use a scan of you that I took and didn't and, and never got approval on? And I think the reality things, is they're going to digitally alter someone five percent and say it's not that person. Well, I think what I, the question I keep asking actually is like they already have the technology to make people who don't exist at all. That's right. They and they're making them. That is exactly what's happening. And like to me, like then why even bother with extras if you can just make a fake person? I think that the reason is because there's a strike going on and that this has to get worked out now and that the people involved feel like this needs to be something that is. Well, what will happen is SAG will say you can't make up fake people and put them in the background. I, I think that's uh, that's likely, but that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. So we're, 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 you know, we're all kind of on the edge of our seat waiting to see what happens. Oh, boy, the strike. You know, I paid for the whole seat, but I only need the edge. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a monster truck reference. So um, anyway, Ben, I think that we are not going to resolve the uh, the AI extra slash, you know, meta human, fake human debate here on this podcast. But I do believe that we are going to hear a ton about this for the next several years. Oh, 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 to be sure. But anyway, I would recommend you and anyone else check out the specific episode of the business with Mike Seymour. Mike Seymour to me is like when I first started listening to podcasts, probably like 2006, the VFX show was one of the podcasts I started listening to. And I feel like that started my understanding of VFX and how they work. And Mike Seymour is someone who has been on the cutting edge of that stuff as long as I've been paying any attention to it. And in fact, he's sort of not related to our podcast, but our first guest ever was his co-host. Yeah, yeah, it was Jason Wingrove who was his co-host on Red Center when Red was kind of a new camera. You know, uh, and I got to give some props to Kim Masters and the business, too. It's such a well-produced show. Oh, and, God, it, yeah. and, it, and it's a podcast secondary. It wasn't born out of being a podcast. It's a radio program. It's a radio program that also is a terrific podcast. It just kind of goes when to show. When I first started listening to it, I would listen to it on my car radio as I was driving around, and I would know when every show was on on KCRW. Now I don't know when anything's on because I just podcast it all. Kim Masters has such a soothing voice to me, too. When I hear it, it's like... <laughs> It's like, ah, there's like, you know, I feel like I'm just kind of like, you know, falling into a a deep hug or something. It's like, I I really, I really like Well, and she's somebody who's just (laughs) been in the business. She's been covering the business as a journalist for so long. Oh, yeah. And she kind of knows all the players and has, you know, kind of. Oh, she knows where everybody is buried. And she was very instrumental in 
the whole, uh, you know, Harvey Weinstein expose and everything that happened, uh, you know, from that, which which I know we talked about extensively on this show. So, uh, I mean, it's uh, no, she's she's a journalist with with a capital J. Yeah, she, yeah, no, she, and there and it is kind of like there aren't enough of those in the world. There aren't. It doesn't. It really feels. It's our like fault. It's, it's it's a bunch of freaking dorks with with microphones doing podcasts. Yeah, on exactly. What what does this world need? A couple more white men with microphones. Yeah, t- yeah, exactly it. what the world needs. <laughs> Wait, are they are they middle aged? Yeah, Sign my middle ass Middle aged up. white men. It, well, you know what? We have one excuse. We started this ten years ago. There was not as many white men doing it back that, then. That so that's true. There, there wasn't was, as many people doing it. Yeah, so yeah, there, yeah. You know, most it, of the radio shows that are now has it been fucking ten years. Uh, it will be in the in the in the winter. Yeah. Oh my Christ! I know, crazy, huh? All right. Well, on that happy note, I think we should uh, go ahead and uh, wrap things up. Ilya, where can people find you? I think, I think I'm sitting right where people can find you. You can. You can find me in Hot Rod Cameras in the screening room right at this very minute or any other time, basically, at HotRodCameras.com. And you want to reach out to me for something professional, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. I get you know requests there now fairly regularly, which is nice. So, nice. Uh, so, Ben, where can people find you? Well, go to BenRock.com, just the way it sounds. Uh, I'm still on Twitter, mysteriously, or X. It's not Twitter anymore. It's called X. They rebranded. What the fuck? Um, yeah. <laughs> Xing kind of sounds like to get rid of something. What? What's that? Oh, tw- uh, man. That's... It's like, man, they just don't make it easy to want to be there anymore. And like people are just falling off of that thing like flies. Uh, but I'm still there. I'm also on Blue Sky. I'm also on Threads. So f- feel free to track me down in, in all of those places. Does Twitter feel like a dumpster fire? I, I see how conflicted you are. You don't have to even answer that question. No, well, uh, here's the thing. Twitter is, I think, still kind of a useful tool. It's just that it's run by a useless tool. <laughs> oh, anyway. I, I, I saw I saw the setup there. I just didn't see how but, that was going to uh, land. No, but, uh, but I mean, but seriously, right now I feel like I, I get 500, it's not 500, but I probably get hundreds, t- 10 fully spam uh, direct messages a day that are all like, buy this stupid cryptocurrency whatever and also like Cheech and Chong's gummies are supporting the whole place <laughs> like it's nothing but Cheech and Chong commercials or ads it's not really commercials and uh, the algorithm is all messed up and I mean it, it's like uh, the monkeys with typewriters are running the place it does feel like a dumpster fire <laughs> the but answer is yes you could have just said yes <laughs> I was describing it to somebody it's like imagine you loved your neighborhood and you were living in a neighborhood that you were just very happy in and then like the richest person on earth bought a house five blocks away from you in the middle of your neighborhood and then like built a giant mountain and then put like searchlights that are constantly going day and night and then started pumping techno music and then started spraying paint so your house was now a different color and like bit by bit just took everything about your neighborhood away but you're like but i do like it here god damn it so when he drives in the dump truck of manure and just you know leaves it on he, your front he lawn he started with the manure and on your front lawn i mean like he went into a thing where people were generally happy and just shook it up for no re- the, the only th- I, I you're gonna hate me for saying this but the only other thing i can think of that was this fucking disruptive in a shitty way was final cut pro 10 <laughs> It was like, let's take ev- everything that's good about this and just wipe our oh, wipe our asses with it goodness. and just ruin it. We're just going to ruin it for everyone who's using this thing. I should get a t-shirt. That says, Final, Final Cut, Cut Pro 7, 7 never, never forget. forget. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, Ilya, before we go, who should we thank? Oh, wow. Let's thank uh, Alana Cody, who put together this interview and so many more coming oh, man, up. We got, we got some great ones coming up. Oh, I can't wait. We should also thank Ben Katz, who uh, I owe some money to, it looks like. I, I, I I've got to, as soon as we're done here, I got to go PayPal him some money. So Ben Katz, money's on the way. Money's on the way. You should yeah, have already, you, you spent, should have already the, spent the money by the time you're hearing this. Yeah, so yeah. That, that's going to happen. He's our fantastic editor who's cutting it together and uh, making me sound somewhat uh, intelligible. Uh, mm. And then, of course... Kay's Alatrachi. Kay's made the music that you heard in this episode. Supposedly, he's tinkering around with some ideas for new music for us. I can't wait to... to Did you see that his music video won, won an award at a film festival? It doesn't surprise me. That music video was awesome. Mm-hmm. That he directed. Yes. Uh, well, of course, he directed. He probably did some visual effects. He probably sure. did like, some color grading. He probably did like four or five different hats yeah. and jobs and things. Anyway, you know, like Kay's, yeah, he's, uh, you know, kicking all the butt, doing all the cool things. So, yeah, we, we should thank him. And if you'd like some music, you should reach out to Kay's Alatrachi, musicbykays.com. He's also about to get married. Did you know that? I did know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that guy's, like everything's coming up roses for him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize coming up Millhouse. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ben, uh, I think that's just about going to do it for this episode. Take us out. Thanks for listening. 
This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.